More than 400 years ago, the tragedy Coriolanus was written by William Shakespeare. The stage play tells of the rise and dramatic fall of a courageous but flawed Roman soldier. My name is Caius Martius. Coriolanus. He is granted the title Coriolanus in recognition of his military success and seeks to gain more political power with enthusiastic support of the Roman Senate. But the common people take some convincing. The characteristics which made Coriolanus an effective military leader cause him to be hated by the people. Opposition riots seek to prevent Coriolanus assuming greater power and he rages against the concept of popular rule. I think he sort of basically makes it up as he goes along. I think he was probably ill-advised into thinking that the uh, Russians would be welcome. There would be a massive uprising in the Russian-speaking lands. He confuses being a Russophone, speaking the Russian language, to being uh, anti-Ukrainian and wanting to uh, join Russia in one country. Russia is playing land grab against all international, all rules, the Helsinki process, whatever. In Ukraine, they got uh, the Crimea, they annexed it. They're making troubles in the east, uh, in the south. So Russia should be stopped. You can't have in 21st century a country that annexes a part, uh, a really big part of a neighboring country without any consequences. I think that is a message that is very clearly there. What the Russian did is really against all international law we agreed on after the Second World War. And you can't change it by all means, even if you have good historical uh, reasons, which they don't have, I think. Coriolanus seems to care only about his self-image and unusually for Shakespeare, the motives behind his actions are not easily seen. He is not like the procrastinating Hamlet where every action is ten times considered. He is not like Macbeth, tormented by ghosts and guilt. We see in Coriolanus a fragility and emptiness which compels our sympathy. He is isolated, alone, and exposed to death by betrayal. Putin, like all these strong men, surrounds himself with yes men and these individuals believe they say things to the president that he wants to hear. And um, obviously he's his own man as well, I wouldn't underestimate that. But I think people will be very afraid of telling Putin, listen, what you're doing is wrong or it's too dangerous. You know, everything that Putin said, actually, frankly, he's tried to deliver on. I think he's been plotting for more than a decade as to how he can reconstitute some kind of crony capitalist, authoritarian, oligarchic type of Soviet Union. It's not based on freedom, democracy or human rights. It's based on uh, a model very much on the kind of strongman, the Siloviki, oligarchs which are tame and in the hands of Putin or controlled by Putin and a deeply corrupt regime. It's not only about Ukraine, it's also what they do in the whole eastern neighborhoods. And we have political sanctions, economic sanctions, and they work. So we should keep them, and if necessary, raise them. Our measures are targeted in a way that uh, they put the pressure on, on the sectors and the people that are directly linked uh, to the crisis in Ukraine, be it uh, um, officials linked to it or um, uh, sectors of economy that are uh, uh, actively involved in this. Nobody knows exactly what would be the long-term aim of European policies vis-à-vis -vis Russia. What we know is from Ms. Mogherini's hearing is that uh, the European Union no longer considers Russia to be a strategic partner. Uh, which is an important political statement because so far technically the, the status of Russia was being a strategic partner to the European Union. We will not uh, let him lose face. I mean, there can be a deal, but he has to go from Ukraine. Caius Marcius Putin is in a dark corner, but Europe is prepared to allow him a dignified path in resolving the Ukraine crisis. This is because Europe fears the absence of Putin. Who will lead Russia with a strong hand if Putin is gone? Will Europe then be confronted by an ever more aggressive Russian reality? Or will the absence of control cause chaos in a nuclear state? What does Russia look like without Vladimir Putin? Oh, that is a difficult question. For the time being, it would be a serious problem for the whole Western world. We've left the channels of communication with Russia open. We, as I said, engage uh, in, uh, in trade, uh, uh, we engage in energy, and we engage, broadly speaking, on, on the diplomatic front. We are passing on these messages uh, uh, repeatedly. But, of course, you cannot pretend that we have a business-as-usual relationship. 
when we have a crisis where people continue to die despite the ceasefire being in place. Russia has lost many soldiers in a relatively short conflict. Exact figures are not known, but Western commentators put the number as several thousand lives lost. I don't think that the uh, Kiev government is going to accept their permanent presence on their territory uh, and it's going to be a, a slow kind of war of attrition. The Russians will constantly lose soldiers. They've lost several thousand soldiers already. The numbers are unclear. I've heard figures up to 4,000. It's been a heavy loss in human uh, lives lost as well as material loss and it's very very expensive to the Russian economy to sustain this kind of campaign. They also have to bail out Crimea now, it's going to cost them, it was costing the Kiev government 800 million dollars a year and the Russians have promised to double pensions and all sorts of sweeteners uh, when they annex the territory. That's going to cost them two or three billion. So if the budget's under pressure with a low oil price uh, and also the international sanctions from the US and the European Union, um, it's going to be problematic for, for Putin uh, ahead of the presidential elections uh, next year in, in Moscow. What does Russia have as an economy? It exports minerals, oil and gas. That's it. I mean, it's not uh, an agricultural nation anymore, it's not an industrial nation. So uh, we have to hurt them in order to help them. Putin's reign has been largely dependent on the price of oil staying above $90 a barrel. The further below this mark the price goes, the more pressure Putin's regime is under. As oil prices soared in recent years, Putin's popularity soared too. He was able to increase salaries for key supporters, including the army, and in general, the lives of many Russians improved. This should have been the moment when substantial economic and social reforms were carried out, but the pace of reform slowed, then it seemed to stall, and now increased political repression indicates that Putin is going in reverse. If the current trends continue, then yes, Russia is in trouble in terms of revenues and therefore Putin is in trouble in terms of what he can do abroad and what he can do at home. Uh, but I'm not sure whether that is the expectation in, among Russian economists as well. We, uh, we have to check that I hear uh, various claims on that. Uh, on the other hand, I think Putin knows that this is a hard constraint. Then he has not the money uh, to bribe the nation. I mean, because the prices of consumer goods are not real prices. They're all subsidized. So if that stops, he has an immense problem. What do we get if Russia goes into reverse? As part of Putin's dramatic persona enhancement storyline, Vladimir Putin appears as a custodian of modern Russian history, the keeper of Stalin's soul. Putin is quite honest. He said that the fact that the Soviet Union disappeared was the biggest tragedy for Russia. So he wants to rebuild more or less the Soviet Union, more or less with the same borders. So this is his policy agenda. It's clear, it's direct, it's tough, and we should have known earlier. There is an option, a way out, I think, is that he's trying, probably using this way out, to say, OK, the troops, Russian troops are withdrawn. They were never there, but anyhow they are withdrawn. That's a positive step, but it can also be an interim step, that he has other plans. Many still think that this withdrawal of the troops is about, you know, regrouping, resting, uh, preparing for another attack. If that horrible scenario were to come to pass, and he moves both towards making a land corridor to Crimea, but tries to move westwards all the way to Transnistria and Odessa, and block off Ukrainian access to the Black Sea, which would be turning Ukraine into a failed state, that would be seen as a major act of aggression. And I think there's a real danger then that some countries like Poland, like some of the Baltic states, might start to supply arms to uh, the Ukrainian armed forces and you could have a very bloody full-scale war. For Europe, the challenge is a desperate gamble that some economic pressure will cause a change of policy. But if Europe and the United States weaken Putin and the Russian economy too much, they could be sowing the seeds of a greater destruction. Do you think he's prepared to use military force against uh, European Union member states? Well, they're also NATO member states, so I don't think so. I mean, uh, if the Baltic states would not be EU, but especially NATO members, he would try. But he knows that if he would confront NATO, we will fight. The distraction of wars on the Western Front will not be enough to save Putin. But the risk to Europe is that as Russia's economy crumbles, the wolf trapped in a corner 
will become more aggressive simply to survive. And in doing so, he may become more like Stalin than he may want, sacrificing his own people in deeper and more futile conflicts. Conflicts which could lead to a direct challenge to NATO and war with Europe. As some diplomats observe with Putin, we always say he will not dare to do this or do that until he does. Nobody is really thinking that Russia will attack a member state of NATO or of the European Union. This is out of discussion. But on the other hand, we see it's not everything predictable what uh, is decided in Moscow. And we have to be clear that we will be in a position to defend if it's necessary. The Ukraine crisis has brought war to Europe's door in a more direct challenge than Islamic jihadis are able to do. And yet Europe's youth are mesmerized by the high definition threats of the Middle East, almost oblivious to history, to economics, and the march of millions to their deaths just 70 years ago. Do you think that Russia is a danger to Europe? Do you think that Afghanistan is more of a danger to Europe? Est-ce que vous pensez que l'Afghanistan est plus dangereuse pour l'Europe? Do you think that in 1939, young people like you thought there was going to be war? Est-ce que vous pensez que des jeunes comme vous allaient connaître la guerre? But when the lights don't work and the school heating is cut in midwinter, maybe then they will realize what the Cold War was all about. War is part of human history, unfortunately. Uh, but we have not experienced war in Europe after 45. Uh, I think that due to NATO especially and European cooperation, we don't find war anymore. But what is now happening in the east of Ukraine, that, that's quasi-war, it, it's a kind of war. Uh, but people don't realize that. I mean, we have lived uh, in ways of peace, in days of peace, and people think it will last forever. I hope that, but I'm not sure.